Hey guys, this is David, the Chess Nerd Bird, with another video. Um, this time I'm going, going to be doing a lesson on chess.com. Uh, they have a nice feature called Lessons, uh, where you can go and basically kind of go over any topic of chess. Um, and they're done by international masters, grandmasters, and they provide immediate feedback. Uh, on basically any move that you could make, they'll provide feedback on why it was good, why it's not good. Um, so to start this series, I'm going to focus on the essentials of opening play. It seems like most people want to perfect their openings anyway. Um, and a lot of my games have been won, not won, but getting good advantages out of the openings because of lack of development or moving the same piece multiple times, which leads to a lack of development. But... Um, so I figured I would start off with this, and so as you can see, we've got lots of lessons to go through um, in this in this video. Not sure if I will get through all of them in one video, so if I don't, um, you can expect a follow-up. So that is kind of the plan. Uh, before we dive into that, though, just want to um, let you guys know you can follow me on multiple um, social media sites on chess.com. You can go to chess.com slash member slash chess nerdbird um, and you can follow me on here. Um, you can befriend me, um, leave me a note on there. Um, you can go to twitter.com slash chess nerdbird and follow me on Twitter. I do have my Twitter account going and then I also have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash chess nerdbird. So definitely check me out on other social media platforms as well. Follow me there to get updates about when. I'll be uh, updating different different places as well. So, um, well, let's go ahead. We'll get jump in right into the essentials of opening play. And the first lesson here we see is develop pieces to good squares. So basically, kind of the format of how this is going to work. I'm basically, um, going to read the uh, the description over here to the right hand side, and then play out the moves and. Um, basically read and, and play. So that's how, how this format will work. Um, if I decide to change it up, then we'll change it up. But um, So you play white. Let's start by learning the right way to develop pieces in the opening. The goal of the opening can be summarized by three main concepts. Control the center, develop pieces, castle, get the king safe. The goal in this lesson is to determine how we should develop our pieces. Let's see what a good developing move looks like. So in this, in this move, um, white played knight f3 is a strong developing move because it develops the knight in a way that maximizes its mobility and central influence. From f3, the knight controls d4 and e5, two important central squares. If white had instead chosen knight h3, the knight wouldn't have been as useful. From h3, the knight would only have access to g5 and f4, but no central squares. Bottom line, develop in a way that helps you control the center. So here you can see black played knight a6. And this is a poor choice because this move doesn't help black control the center. As you can see, this knight doesn't have many options from a6. If instead black played knight c6, then black would have influenced the important d4 and e5 squares. Let's see what happens after white plays knight c3. And now black plays knight h6 is just as bad as knight a6. Black's knights do not control the center and in the best case scenario can only control four squares each, whereas white's knights control eight squares each. After e4, white fully controls the center, thanks entirely to white's good development and control over the center. Black is unable to play d5 or e5 without facing capture from white. Black cannot occupy the center and is now destined to play a cramped position with hardly any options. This was black's punishment for developing poorly with knight a6 and knight h6 and not focusing on the center. So why is controlling squares, especially central squares, so important? The more squares you control, the more options you have for your pieces. And the more options you have, 
naturally, the more good options you will have. Controlling central squares is important because often that's where your pieces, especially knights, stand very well. If you control useful squares, you will be able to place your pieces optimally and from there be able to create strong tactical threats and generate powerful attacks. Thus, it is very important to fight for the center in the opening. Whoever controls more useful squares and stands better developed after the opening will have greater chances of winning the game. So long story short, develop towards the center and develop your pieces with a purpose of controlling the center. All right, so beginners often make the mistake of developing the rooks too early by pushing an edge pawn two spaces and then advancing a rook to the third rank or sixth rank at black. This is a bad idea. So white starts off by playing Bobby Fischer's favorite opening move, 1e4, a great move that controls the center. Now black is initiating the bad rook opening. So white continues strong development by playing knight f3, but of course moves like d4 and knight c3 are also strong because they're going to control central squares. Black did it. White now has to face the bad rook opening. This approach from black, or if white did it, is often a sign of someone who knows basics Someone who knows the basics of how to move the pieces but has no formal training as far as basic strategies. Even strategies as simple as control the center and develop your minor pieces, knights and bishops first. So now white has to figure out how to punish black for choosing such a, shame, a shameful opening. Now it looks like it's my move here. Um, so just following natural principles, I'm going to control the center but also make it an attacking move. So I'm going to play d4. So that's right, white gains a tempo on black's rook and also claims a greater stake of the center at the same time. So white will keep taking advantage of this poor rook. So think about moves here. Um, Play knight c3. Very nice. So knight c3 develops a piece while protecting the e4 pawn, which black's rook was attacking. White will be able to gain another tempo in the rook by playing a move like bishop c4 and might end up winning the rook for a minor piece in the near future. The lesson we can learn from this is that we shouldn't develop major pieces, being our rooks and queens, too early in the opening simply because they will get kicked around. We cannot afford to trade a major piece for a minor piece in the opening because the major piece is far more valuable. Keep the major pieces close to home until it's safe for them to come out. All right, so now we're gonna be learning from the four knights opening, move by move, and try to understand why each move played is good. And so this is this right here, just try to understand why each move is played. I think that, I think it's very important when you're learning your openings is try to understand why those moves were played. So more than likely at some point in the opening, your opponent is going to get you out of book or you're probably going to get yourself out of book you know uh, and by book i just mean the, the moves that you quote unquote have memorized in the opening and so when you understand why the moves are played you kind of understand the plans behind the opening and can therefore make intelligent decisions over the board without needing to rely on your memory for what's supposed to be played next So the four knights opening starts with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, knight f6. So white strikes the center with e4. Black strikes the center too. Both sides now have some influence in the center. Knight f3 develops the knight with the threat of winning a free pawn. Developing in a way that makes real threats is always a good idea. Knight c6 is a good move because it develops a piece and protects the e5 pawn, which was undefended. White develops his other knight to c3 and increases white's influence over central light squares. Light squares just meaning e4 and d5 in this case. 
Black continues his development and remembers to develop in a way that helps control the center. Bishop c4. Develops the bishop to an active square and, en and enables kingside castling for white. Castling early is usually a great idea. Um, here black played bishop c5, but he could also play knight takes e4, which leads to knight takes e4, and then d5, which forks the, um, the bishop on c4 and the knight on e4. And after bishop d3, um, he'll regain the, the piece sacrificed by d takes e4. Again, there are several possible moves for white, but castle stands out. Generally, you should castle within the first 10 moves. There's nothing wrong with castling as early as move 5. Now that the king is, safe, is safely castled, white can focus on wrapping up development. Black should castle as well. d3 is the best move because it opens a diagonal for our dark squared bishop and protects our important e4 pawn. While d3 is not a move that develops a piece, it certainly enables strong development. White would like to play bishop g5 and pin black's knight. Black should play h6 to prevent this pin and deprive white of this strong developing move. Making moves that prevent the opponent from developing, developing optimally is often a good idea as well. Note that if black delays h6 and instead plays d6, White would play bishop g5, and on h6, white would take the knight with bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, and that allows knight d5. This would leave white with a very strong centralized knight. Now with that being said, having, having played for quite a few years, um, these moves like h6, h3, a3, a6, to avoid being in a pin, um, you really have to understand why you play those moves because otherwise you just waste tempo. Like for instance, if, if Bishop G5 wasn't really you know a threat um, to be able to, to get a superior piece, um, then H6 is really just a waste of time. And I find that most beginners, most intermediate players don't fully understand when to play moves like H6 to stop you know a Bishop pinning a knight. So until you really understand the reasoning behind that. I would say just just work on developing your pieces. Now, um, obviously in this opening it mattered, which is why they probably showed it. But don't always just play like h3 or h6 just to prevent a pin from happening, because it's it's not always something that that you need to do. So bishop e3 places the bishop on an active square and attacks Black's bishop on c5. Taking on e3 is not advisable for black because the doubled e pawns white would be left with are good for white. A pawn on e3 would help white dominate the center once he plays pawn to d4. Additionally, white would gain a semi-open f-file, which would certainly make the f1 rook a happy piece. A happy piece. And a happy place on f1. Taking on e3 is not good for black, and neither is leaving the bishop on c5. Bishop b6 is the right way to respond to bishop e3. Sure, white could give black a doubled pawn by playing bishop takes b6. However, after a takes b6, black would gain a semi-open a file and would have more than enough compensation for the doubled b pawns. So this is something especially, you know, I struggle with, um, but definitely players below um, probably expert level and maybe even expert, but I can't speak for expert players because I'm not there yet, um, is the idea of tension and the, the idea of tension is the two bishops that you're seeing here you know one could capture the other a lot of beginners just capture pieces because they think well if I capture pieces then I'll get down to a simpler game and I won't hang a piece now the problem is by sometimes trading pieces you can help your opponent's position get stronger in this case white would get the pawn on e3 which gives them better central control keeps the knights out, um, and so forth. Whereas black says, if you want to capture, if you want to trade bishops, I want to do it on my own terms. Thus, if you capture, I'll give myself an, a semi-open A file, 
and be able to play a little more on the queen side um, in return for doubled pawn. So there's always trade-offs. Um, and so when you're considering exchanging pieces, just always take into consideration how the position is going to change once those pieces are off the board and see if it favors you or if it doesn't favor you. So that's a little bit of advice there from me. So here white plays h3. So black may play knight g4 in the near future to irritate our dark squared bishop. Even if black doesn't like this idea, he may decide to play d6 followed by bishop g4 to pen our knight. In any case, black would like to use this g4 square. h3 is a solid way to limit black's options and solidify our position. So again, just going back to don't, don't play h3, h6, you know, those kind of moves just automatically. Play them only if they make sense to help you keep control over the center. So now we're going to be learning from the Roy Lopez. So it's time to dive into the popular Roy Lopez opening. This lesson will explain the basics of the Roy Lopez, also referred to as the Spanish, and relate it to key opening principles. So we already see the, a similar position of the four knights defense with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. And that's how the Roy Lopez is, um, is reached. So white is looking to play a developing move that also applies pressure to black center. So what's a, what's a good developing move that will apply pressure to black center? And that is bishop b5. So this actually initiates the Roy Lopez. This move develops a piece, enables castling, and seems to be threatening. Bishop takes c6, after which black's e-pawn hangs. And that's a tactic called removing the guard. So the knight on c6 is guarding the pawn on e5. So it looks like white is threatening to play bishop takes c6, and then after black captures back, then play knight takes e5. But that doesn't work, um, and I'm not sure if this lesson will show it or not. So. Um, so 3a6 is the most common move, but knight f6, called the Berlin defense, is often played as well. So bishop takes c6, causes a dent in black's position, and, remove, and removes the defender of the e5 pawn. This is called the exchange variation, or the exchange Roy. So black should play d takes c6. After d takes c6, if white plays knight takes e5, Black can fork white's knight and pawn by playing queen to d4. Black is perfectly solid here. So if we're talking about a developing move, um, so just a couple ones that kind of, you know, jump out at me is castles, you know, knight c3. Um, castles right away looks good because then you are threatening um, Uh, knight takes e5, but I mean, you can also play d3. Um, you can play knight c3. That would also guard e4, thus threatening knight takes e5. So a couple of different ways to play here. I think just castling would probably be the correct answer. So black's e5 pawn is not hanging. So white should go ahead and just castle. White will soon play d4 and enjoy a small positional advantage due to extra space and a better pawn structure. Also note that black's e5 pawn will remain unprotected and black will have to spend a turn defending this pawn. Both Kasparov and Fisher employed the Roy Lopez at the highest levels because every move white made in this opening made sense from the opening principle standpoint and also had a purpose behind it. Developing with a purpose is vital and for beginners and intermediate players, becoming proficient at finding strong developing moves is all it takes to play the opening well. There's no need to memorize opening theory until a much higher level. Make sure every move you make is worth the cost you pay for it, and that cost is a turn. Opening greed. So while taking free pawns is often a great idea, overdoing it is not. Each turn spent taking free pawns is each turn not spent on developing pieces. We will see the drawback of being too greedy in this lesson. We will take a look at the Danish gambit, which can be reached after e4, e5, d4, e takes d4, and c3. So e4, e5, now white plays d4, offering up a pawn. And now white says here, you may have another pawn by playing c3, and black takes on c3, and now white develops a piece. So white could have 
could have also recaptured back on c3 with the knight on b1 and this would also have left white with some compensation for the pawn. Now black can take another pawn on b2 but this two but this is a tough position to play for him. White's initiative is dangerous if he plays if he takes the pawn on b2. But he does it and so now white captures back with the bishop. So bishop b4 check. Knight c3 develops a piece while blocking the check from black's bishop. Black develops and, and enables castling. Now white is ready to castle. White's e-pawn is hanging, but taking it is not advisable for black. Black would be left with two developed pieces that are not protected. Black would still be uncastled and have no center, center control. Black should castle here. Let's see what happens if black gets too greedy. So too much greed is not good. When you're spending a lot of time in opening and moving the same pieces over and over again, and you allow your opponent to get their pieces out, bad things can start to happen. So yes, we must castle and bring the king to safety. By castling, we also bring another potential attack into the game against black's king, which is the, right, the white rook coming to e1. So bishop takes c3, and now, what do we think the correct move is? So white should recapture with the knight because we want to keep our bishop pair. Bishops are superior to knights in open positions because open diagonals give them great scope. And just an open position is one that you're seeing here. I mean, there's no pawns in the center. It's very, pieces can move from one side of the board to the other. So that's, that's considered an open position. Um, and so bishops are going to reign true there, which is why I took with the knight because I didn't want him to take back. Like if I played bishop takes e3 and the knight takes e3, uh, I've kind of lost some of my, some of my, uh, you know, attacking chances. I'm still doing great, but it has been reduced a little bit because I don't have that bishop there. So knight takes c3, and bishop takes c3. So white's bishop stand very well in c3 and c4. Black still isn't controlling the center and has no pieces developed. Black is nearly lost. Black's only playable move is queen g5. Castling will actually lose on the spot. Um, so I believe this is the move. So yeah, so white has a forced mate. So this is threatening mate on g7. Black tries to defend, but mate is inevitable because now I can just play my queen here. So black's kingside dark squares are defenseless. Black's f-pawn is pinned, thus immobile, and there's no defense to the mating threat on g7. So the purpose of opening gambits is to gain a lead in development and acquire the initiative. The price one typically pays for their lead in development is a pawn. While gambits can be fun to play, most of them are not strong. In this lesson, we will explore one of the most popular gambits employed at the highest levels, the Smith-Moore Gambit. So the Smith-Moore Gambit is reached after e4, c5, d4, c takes d4, and c3. So e4, c5. So this is the Sicilian defense, and it's one of the most popular openings in chess at all the levels. Um, so d4, but other normal moves include knight f3 and knight c3. So c takes d4. This is a common trade in the Sicilian. Uh, usually white has played knight f3 first, and then d4, so that after c takes d4, you can play knight takes d4. Uh, but some lines white does play queen takes d4, but this is the, the smith moore gamut, so we're going to see the move c3 play. So this is now the starting position of the smith moore gamut. 
And by playing d takes c3, black has accepted our gambit. So as you can see, white has a piece developed on c3, an e4 pawn that controls key central squares, and I semi-open d file for the queen. And black hasn't moved anything besides the c pawn. So technically white has sufficient compensation for the one pawn he has sacrificed. Um, so is e5 a good move for black? That is the question. So it says e5 would not be a good move for black because after bishop c4, the f7 pawn would be hard to defend. Being behind in development and having the weak f7 square exposed certainly cannot be good for black. Black's f7 square would be safe with a pawn on e6. And here, black played d6, but he could have played knight c6 or, or e6. And those are all fine. So with white having a lead in development and now having a bishop aiming at the f7 square, black needs to be careful. If black plays e6, the opening would continue with knight f3, then knight c6, then castle by white, bishop e7, queen e2, knight f6, and castles for white. Again, he's got some, uh, some, some editing issues here. Um, and this is where white still has the initiative and a lead in, in, in development as compensation for one pawn. So let's see how the game could end quickly if black is not careful. So knight f6, it develops a piece and definitely follows opening principles. However, it is important to make sure each move you make in the opening is also tactically justified. So when you're playing the openings, following principles is fine, but also make sure that your tactics aren't going to cost you either. So it's now my move, and it's asking me to find a move that tactically justifies white's position. So it looks like e5 with the idea that if d takes e5, then um, bishop takes f7 check. Yeah, I think e5. So that's right, e5 is a very strong move that forces black to play knight f to d7 after which knight f3 gives white a favorable position. So what happens if black plays d takes e5? So now I can play bishop takes f7, and the game is over. Black's only legal move is to play king takes f7, after which white wins a free queen via queen takes d8. Again, one of those removing, removing the guard tactics. All right, so while gambits are often used to gain an attacking setup, they can also be played for positional gain. The queen's gambit temporarily offers a pawn for a better center. So the queen's gambit is usually reached by d4, d5, and then white playing c4. And it's one of the most popular systems for white. So d4, d5, c4. So after c4, which is the, the most popular moves for black, are e6, known as the orthodox defense, and c6, known as the Slav defense, which keeps black's d-pawn on d5. For example, d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop e7 is a solid continuation for black. So let's see what happens if black goes for the queen's gambit accepted variation, which is d takes e4. So now white plays e4. White has more space and control in the center than black. So black develops a piece with a purpose. He attacks the e4 pawn. So knight c3 is a solid opening move. It develops a piece and defends the e4 pawn. Black defends the d5 square and makes the f8 bishop mobile. This makes sense because black should castle soon. White employed a positional sacrifice to gain strong center control. The queen's gambit is sound because the pawn sacrifice is temporary, whereas the positional advantage remains in white's hands. 
All right, so opening principles say we shouldn't develop the queen too early. In this lesson, we will study this concept. We will analyze a bad variation of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian defense. We can reach the Scandinavian defense after e4, d5. So e4, d5. So black chooses to challenge white's e-pawn right away. The Scandi is a sharp system that some masters love, whereas many claim it guaranteed white a clear edge if played properly. Now, with all these openings and what we're going over, where you know white has a clear edge, um, white has a better position, um, things like that at, at my level, class B, I mean class A probably, and down, um, what grandmasters say about openings, it, it doesn't matter as much for us. Um, because our opponents aren't going to know the, um, you know the little reasons why the openings are better. So as long as you're following opening principles, not following for tactics, um, you know you can you can play pretty much any opening you want. So, but just my little two cents. So e takes d5, and now queen takes d5. So the reason many players question the scandy is because knight c3 gains a tempo on the queen. It turns out the black's queen is well placed on a5 or d6, and even world champion at the time, Vishianen, has em had employed this system as black. So after knight c3, black should place the queen on a square where she cannot be attacked. Again, queen a5 and queen d6 are fine options for black. Queen e5 check is a weak move because black spends a turn to give a check that doesn't do anything besides allowing white to continue developing his pieces. Don't move the same piece twice in the opening unless you have a very good reason to do so. So bishop e2. So develops a piece, gets out of check. Black develops his bishop and creates a mini trap. Do you see it? I mean, when I look at this position, I see that my bishop's guarded three times, or four times. So I'm just going to play a developing move. So white should play d4, which gains space in the center and keeps black's queen. Knight f3 looks like a good move, but it would be a mistake because after bishop takes f3, white has to play g takes f3, which ruins white's pawn structure. White needs to remember that his e2 bishop is currently pinned. So black's queen gets kicked around once again. Now d5 and f3 are both very strong moves. After d5, black's queen has to move yet again, and the opening is not going well for black. Queen e5. So black is stubborn and refuses to retreat the queen back to, to a square such as d7. Keeping the queen in the center won't go well for black. Bishop e3, it develops the bishop to a good location. The bishop covers two good diagonals from e3, and this move also unpins the e2 bishop. So again, white is playing moves that have purpose, get his pieces out, while black's been moving his queen all around the board. So bishop takes e2, queen takes e2, knight f6. So black finally develops another piece, but it is already too late. White has an overwhelming lead in development, and the position is hopeless for black. Knight f3. This definitely is a nightmare for black. White gains another tempo and has now almost finished development. Poor black has to waste another turn. After queen d6, white can continue with either the simple castle queenside or the tactical knight b5. Both moves give white a winning position. From this example, it should be obvious that letting your queen get kicked around the opening is not good. Avoid this by keeping the queen close to home. Alright, so this is a common opening mistake beginners make. It is unnecessarily delaying castling. So they don't castle. They think their king's safe, they, they think it takes too much time, and they just don't castle. So it's often easy to take advantage of this mistake by preventing them from ever castling. If your opponent can't castle, the king will remain vulnerable throughout the game. It is white's turn to play. Both sides have equal material, but black hasn't castled. So how can white exploit this situation? It looks like
looks like we can just play bishop a3. So the a3, f8 diagonal is now under white's control, and black can no longer castle. This move is also an example of developing with tempo, as black's queen has the move now. So black has no good moves. On queen d7, either knight takes e5 or queen c3 would prove white's advantage. So here it looks like, um, I was thinking about like knight g5, hits the queen again, the queen is basically forced to either c8 or d7. Or I'm thinking about bringing the rook on a1 into the game. Um, or just queen c3. Yeah, I think maybe queen c3, and then after knight d7, then or no, knight knight b5 first. So white takes advantage of the fact that black's queen is nearly immobile. She has no good squares, so a knight on g5 would be very useful for attacking black's king. Once again, black didn't have any good options, so just queen d7. And now queen c5 is a powerful move that consolidates control over the a3 f8 diagonal and threatens to play queen takes e5 check. So if black were to play h6, then queen takes e5 wins a queen as black has no other move besides queen e6. So black is trying to defend, but the punishment for not castling will be a lost position. So queen a5 attacks the c7 pawn and allows the a3 bishop to attack black's queen. Black's queen is tied down to the defense of the e pawn. This is black's only move because he has to defend the e5 pawn and now knight f3 again. So developing passively is a common mistake beginners and intermediate players make. In this lesson, we will learn how to punish passive development by our opponents. So yeah, so this is something I see a lot too, is people will develop their pieces, but they only put them like on the, on the second rank, like right in front of their right in front of their other pieces. So you can get into a lot of trouble this way too if you're not developing your pieces actively towards the center. So this position was reached after e4, e5, knight f3, d6, d4, knight d7, bishop c4, and bishop e7. So black has developed rather passively and doesn't have a stable position. Is it possible for white to take advantage of black's passive development? So d takes e5 is the only way for white to punish black setup. This move ultimately gains white a pawn. Besides the material gain, white will stand strong positionally as well. On d takes e5, white has queen d5, which wins a free knight after knight h6, and bishop takes h6, followed by castles, because otherwise there's checkmate on f7. So 
So knight takes e5, forces black to play d takes e5, after which white has a free pawn in addition to having a great position. That's the only move. So now white threatens to take on f7 and e5. Black cannot stop both threats. So g6 is the only move that makes sense, because black cannot allow queen takes f7. So queen takes e5, and black had to stop the threat of queen takes h8. So bishop h6, so this was something that was taught in the other the previous lesson was to stop your opponent from castling, and so this develops a piece and prevents the king from castling. So, all right, so queen d6, so white trades because black's position is hopeless. And it looks like now. Bishop g7. That's right. This wins a free piece for white. Black can safely resign. In this example, we saw how developing passively is not wise. If your opponent develops passively, you should think actively while developing optimally. You will be able to punish passive setups as long as you play the opening phase accurately and strike at the right time. All right, and that finishes the essentials of opening play. I hope that you have learned something from those lessons. Like I said, develop your pieces towards the center actively. If you can prevent your opponent from castling, do so, um, as long as it makes sense for your development. And practice those principles until you just do them every single game. So what I would recommend is playing, when you play your games, go back through them. Did you get all your pieces out? Did you get them towards the center? Um, if you didn't, then continue to play and just focus on that. You know, don't worry about how you do in the middle game or in the end game. It's important, but until you can get every single one of your pieces developed before you start moving pieces multiple times or making pointless pawn moves on the side of the board, it's not going to matter how well you play those middle games or end games anyway if you can't get your pieces out to play the game. So that is my recommendation. Until you get comfortable with that, Continue to practice that in your games going forward. Um, you know, one-minute games are, are good for that for me because um, I'll just focus on getting my pieces out. I'm not necessarily worried about the structure or anything like that. I'm worried about control of the center and getting my pieces out. Um, but that's also a big thing I focus on with my blitz games. You know, a little bit longer time controls. Um, you know, five-minute games I find are good for that as well. You know, work on just getting your pieces out, getting developed, and then, you know, worrying about playing the game from there. But um, that's my advice. I hope you learned something from this video and can take something away from it. So until next time, this is David, the Chess Nerd Bird. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, I'll have a, a, a new video every day uh, covering some type of topic, whether it's some games, uh, going over my games, um, these lessons, going through the chess.com drills, or going through um, uh, tactics. So make sure you subscribe and keep up to date as I go through different lessons on my way to becoming or as I on my way to earn the expert title for USCF rated tournaments. And until next time, have a good night.